John, I love this time of year, March Madness. Jay Wright's first tournament and Jim Nance's last. There's Morton. You got it, Grant, right? To eat. I got it. I got it right here. Nice catch. <laughs> they could have used you to beat the press. You couldn't have scripted that any better, Jim. I mean, <laughs> I've been here for virtually all the Big Ten tournament games. Didn't think the ball would end up in my hands at the end. I was going to shoot it. And we're back, the Marshan and Oran Sports Media Podcast. I'm Andrew Marshan, sports media columnist for the New York Post. He's John Oran, the media reporter for the Sports Business Journal. John, a lot to talk about. We have the NCAA tournament. We have your Super Bowl, your NCAA championship, the RSNs <laughs> exploding. We'll, we'll get into that a little bit later. But what that means, Bob Iger with some big comments about ESPN's future, uh, changes at Monday Night Football. We'll get into that. Uh, and uh, we have some questions at the end, but let's start off. Who's up and who's down? Who's up? Who's down? All right, Andrew, let's get started. Who do you got? John, my who's up, Adam Schefter and Ian Rappaport. And the reason is now we're just in New York and basically everywhere. We've been through this Aaron Rodgers situation and waiting and waiting. And there's reports. Trey Wingo says this. Boomer Siason says that. And I think this kind of shows you the value of Schefter and Rappaport um, because, you know, they're not perfect. I've gotten on them, especially Schefter, a number of times. But they do have credibility. And we're sort of waiting. And, you know, by the time some people listen to this, maybe the Aaron Rodgers story has finally broken. Um, and maybe those guys don't have it. But I will say, until they say it and others, you know, Brian Costello from, you know, our paper, if he says it, a uh, great jet beat writer, uh, you know, someone like that, that also, of course, has credibility. But I do think this shows the value because you have reports. Uh, we'll get into a little bit later. I want to talk about something Rich Eisen said, you know, last week about Tom Brady that I didn't agree with. Uh, Trey Wingo kind of throwing it out there. Uh, and I think this is where these guys' values really come in is that when they say it, you trust it. Well, my who's up is going to be John Diamond and John Bogus, and they're the two ad sales guys for Warner Brothers Discovery Sports and for CBS, and their teams have sold out March Madness, no surprise, together, brought in a record haul, more than $1 billion in ad sales. But Andrew, this is a pick that represents much more than March Madness and much more than, than ad sales. College basketball this season had experienced, are you ready for a dad joke? A bit of a rebound, Andrew. Oh, <laughs> Thank you very much. Trigger side, Chris Mason. <laughs> Fox set a record viewership this year. It had the most watched college basketball game in its history. DePaul Creighton, which uh, was on Christmas Day coming out of the, the NFL. CBS posted its best numbers in years. ESPN posted its best numbers in years. Women's college basketball, it also outperformed. Fox set a record uh, with its uh, women's games. ESPN threw the biggest women's college basketball audience in more than a decade uh, last month with its LSU-South Carolina game. And all this means is that for Turner and for CBS, the lines have been set. And I'm predicting big ratings for the men's tournament. I'm predicting big ratings for the women's tournament on ESPN and ABC. All right, John, my who's down is Brett Yarmark, the commissioner of the Big 12. The reason is because the people covering the Big 12 tournament were who's up, as in up, up, up in almost <laughs> the last row of the arena. Uh, and it, it was an embarrassment for the Big 12, an embarrassment for Yarmark. Now, People are going to say, I don't care about reporters. All you care about is you're getting a free seat and you get to watch. Nope, that's not what's going on. Number one, reporters are there. They illuminate the action. They tell you the stories. And if they can't see and they're just watching off a monitor, it's not really worth it for their newspapers and websites and TV stations to send them to these arenas to cover your event where you get paid. So the idea that the, they're there for free. No, they're entities. And some people even now with Substack and all that are paying themselves to get there. They're paying to be there and they should be able to see. Do they need to be in the front row? Maybe not. But they need to be able to view the game, to report on the game. And 
Brett Yormark said something like, we're going to give a best in class experience. That's BS. And it's awful. It makes my skin crawl because these are people who are promoting your sport, promoting your league, and they're helping you. Yes, the media can be critical. The media can be tough. But overall, when they're covering your games and putting them in all their newspapers, all their websites, all their TV stations, they're promoting and you should show them a little respect. And it's not a sports writer complaining. I'll never cover a Big 12 game. This will not affect me at all. It's just the right thing to do, the right way to treat the media. Even if the media has a bad name these days and how they should cover an event. And if you really want to be best in class, Brett Yormark, you need to have your the people who cover your sport, your league, your championship being able to see the actual court. Andrew, my who's down, I'm uh, going to the RSNs and I'm focused on Diamondbacks owner, Ken Kendrick. Uh, honestly, I could have picked Padres owner, Peter Seidler or Pirates owner, Bob Nutting or the Rockies owner or the Reds owner or the Guardians owner. And that's because these are the teams that have contracts that the RSNs are right now trying to get out of. Diamond Sports, which if anybody has listened to this podcast for the past uh, couple of years, knows owns all the Bally Sports regional sports networks, and it is late on a payment to the Diamondbacks. This is the first time that this has happened. They're still within a grace period. They have until later this week to actually make a payment. The Padres are the ones that are up next. And uh, really, for months, we've been talking about how Rob Manfred and Adam Silver have been warning their teams to be prepared for pain. Well, that pain has just started. AT&T Sportsnet was paying the Pirates North up $60 million a year. The Diamondbacks have a deal. It runs through 2035. The Padres make $60 million per year from their RSN. I hope Machado got paid up front, Andrew. Uh, baseball says they say they have a plan. They're trying to get their rights back. They're trying to cut deals with cable companies. They're trying to make these games available via streaming. But opening day is only two weeks away. And none of those plans are ready to go right now. There's still lots of questions. We're going to get deeper into that uh, topic number three. Uh, but let's start off with the NCAA tournament. First off, John, congratulations to the Maryland Terrapins making the tournament. Uh, that's a big accomplishment. Uh, up by I was on a uh, Inside, Inside Maryland Sports podcast on Sunday night and uh, predicted the Maryland with the final four run. So, you know, we'll, we'll wow. see. Like take that to the get your FanDuel and DraftKings account going, everyone. I, I take that to the bank. That was not unbiased at all. all right, the big news for this NCAA tournament, uh, Jim Nance's final tournament. That's probably the biggest headline. The other big headline is Jay Wright, his first tournament. He could become a fixture. Uh, you know, obviously one of the more successful uh, college coaches of the last 25 years. Now he's uh, going to be in studio. And then eventually maybe one day you could see him on the lead broadcast team uh, with Ian Eagle and Grand Hill. If, you know, Phil Raftery is still going strong and could go forever, but if he does retire at some point, uh, you can see Jay Wright maybe moving into that chair. Uh, but uh, what do you, when you look at this tournament, what excites you in terms of uh, the media aspect of it? You know, you also have Turner, you know, in their transition and Warner Brothers, uh, Discovery Sports, uh, and, you know, what what they're becoming. So what what says you, John? Well, as you know, Jay Wright has done it in, in the past, but now that he's retired, it's a full-time gig for him. And for me, he has, uh, he's very telegenic. He delivers uh, his, his lines very well. He has a lot of gravitas. I mean, he's won national championships out there. I think that he has a star all over him. And and when when he speaks and when he when he talks about what's happening in a game, I find that 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 I'm listening a lot more than say you know not to pick on Clark Kellogg, but he's on the on the you know the the, the same booth. It's sort of like he he just brings his star power and gravitas to the show that that I really particularly like. And I think right the thing that I think will probably come through. And I think people who know him well would say this. He has a likability factor, comes across as a really good guy, which is a lot of the battle on TV. Um, if you're likable, uh, that helps. Uh, and so I, I, I covered him when he was at Hofstra uh, for a couple of games, you know, so I knew him a little bit. Uh, it was very nice to a young reporter uh, that obviously went on to bigger and better things. Um you know, Hofstra's great, but he, you know, obviously went on to win a national championship uh, with Villanova. And then Nance, final tournament for Jim Nance, the Houston angle 
is going to be a big one. He's doing the Houston games uh, the opening weekend. Uh, so he's doing Thursday, Saturday. Usually top team does Friday, Sunday. Um, but he's doing Thursday, staying with Houston. Uh, he's done some interviews where he even talked about we uh, when he's talking about <laughs> Houston. It is his alma mater. Uh, he does have a close relationship with them. The final four is in Houston. So Nance said that if that were if Houston were to win it, uh, be one of the maybe the top moment of his career. It seems like he's really pulling for it. Um, but this will be his final tournament. Uh, you know, with him working with Raftery and Grant Hill. Yeah, things to watch there. Uh, the, the, during a press conference preceding uh, the 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 tournament, uh, he got really emotional just talking talking about this. And Andrew, I know you hate when I say this, but I truly believe that there are big game voices out there. And and I, I think anybody can get to be a big game voice. It takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of uh, top quality. And I'm going to miss Jim Jim Nance on on the tournament. I think that you know he he does bring a big game voice. Where I hear Jim Nance on the call, I I, I just said there there's something in my brain that goes off, and I said this is a this is a game that's an important game that I'm I'm going to want to take note of. Yeah, the thing I don't like really more is the chicken and egg thing. That's my thing, is that they're, especially if you look at the Super Bowl, and that just changed with Kevin Burkhart doing this past one. But if you'd look before, I feel like there's four people, maybe maybe four or five people who've done like the last 20 years of the Super Bowl. And so it's like, well, those are the only people who could do it. And yes, of course, there's kind of like a Pavlov's dog thing going on here is that if John Oran, it's a big game and he constantly hears Jim Nance's voice, then you're going to associate it with it. You start drooling. Um, And so, yeah. (laughs) Did you just accuse me of drooling, Andrew Marquez? So, 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 uh, yeah, so I don't disagree with you that there's big, you know, Joe Buck, Al Michaels. Uh, you know, there's people who have been associated with big games, so you can have that. But I always feel like there are people, like I think next year when they bring an Iron Eagle, there's they're you know probably going to go up instead of like you know uh, it because I think he's better. I've written that you know for a few years now, um, and so uh, yeah. But well, you know, we both they're... praised uh, Kevin Burkhart's call the Super Bowl uh, for certain. Yeah, he doesn't have. I don't know when it happens. I don't think there's a after five years you get it, but he doesn't have what I, I consider that big game voice yet. I think he can develop it. I'm not sure exactly, may, maybe calling two Super Bowls in three years. Yeah, but I think that's because we grade these things and it's kind of a different, like if you, you either can do, like here's the thing, if I were choosing who I was going to have, can, can they do the job? That's like the number one thing. I know that sounds maybe obvious, but when you look at some of the decisions that have been made by some networks, um, ESPN, Monday Night Football at times, um, the where they haven't necessarily picked someone who was, this is the top person we can get. Um, and so that level that you need at the highest, at the for the biggest games, that's what the question is. And not necessarily, so, I, so that's where I kind of, for me personally, it's just like, does that person have a big name voice? I think for, for writers, Back in the day, it maybe changed now, but, you know, because of the internet and whatever. But, you know, can you be a columnist was always a thing. And, like, you get, like, anointed a columnist in, in, in a lar- in a large degree, especially back in the day when there were more columnists. Um, and someone who was an editor chooses, and then sometimes people would have that job for 30 years. And even if they really never writ- wrote anything that was very interesting, or they just kept that job. So maybe that's why, because I guess as a young person, I noticed that. It's like, how do you become that next level and it feels like you have to be anointed the internet's kind of changed that a little bit to get back to what you said originally i don't hate it i just think it's a little bit chicken and egg yeah yeah i don't disagree let's get to topic two which is actually probably topic one of this podcast andrew and it is uh uh, espn and uh going direct to consumer and last week at a morgan stanley conference bob Iger brought this up again andrew all right, so let me do my I'm an Ithaca grad like Bob Iger, <laughs> slightly more successful than me. Let me do my Bob Iger voice here and I will uh, we'll read this. And listen, to save paper, this is like at one point, it, the characters on this, because there's going to be seven. I was printing it out. There's going to be seven pages. I put it in like four pages. So it's like really small here. This is Bob Iger. At this point, ESPN Plus is what I call a flanker business or a business or brand to the main ESPN brand. Uh, Down the road, at some point, I think it's inevitable ESPN will become a direct-to-consumer business. Um, There's a reason to be bullish. 
So that that's the money quote. Um, he's saying inevitable when that you know, you've gone back and forth of what that means. You know, we talked last week. I still think within I, I have three years, three and a half years in terms of our bet because I said within five years. I still think it's going to be much less than than the three and a half years. I would say two probably at the most, if not less. There are so many uh, other things that are happening, and it's how far cord cutting goes, how much uh, ESPN starts. They're not losing money with their regular channel, but uh, uh, the, the making less money from the regular channel. Um, but th there are a lot of issues uh, th that Bob Iger and Jimmy Pitaro have to consider. ESPN is now a sort of its, its only, you know, they're, they're by itself. So they're responsible for um, you know, profits are responsible for revenues. Uh, and right now, if you look at, let's say ESPN makes, I think they make a little bit more than $10 per month, but let's say it makes $10 per month, 76 million homes uh, to today. I mean, what do you need to, uh, to, to charge in order to get like 20 million people to come and, 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 and look at it? And I, I did back of the envelope math and it's like close to $40 in order to, to happen. And that's that that's for ESPN, ESPN two, just the ESPN suite of of channels. I mean that's that's big. So if ESPN decides I'm not making a prediction here one way or another because like yeah. we're, we're honestly flopping. We, yeah it's like you're we, we, we have no idea. But this this much you I do know. know I have an idea. You have no idea. Oh yeah. <laughs> you're yeah stick with it. If ESPN takes the mothership and yeah. goes direct to uh direct to consumer the entire media rights business is going to have to be reset to make this work. I mean, right now, what they're paying two and a half million to to the NFL. You know, the NBA is going is the rate. I think they're one point five for the NBA. It's that that's going up. College MLB, they're 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 paying like ten billion dollars in in rights fees. They're going to have to reset that. The cost the cost structure that the cable bundle provided is totally unsustainable and direct to consumer. And so if if ESPN goes direct to consumer with the mothership, the, the, you you're you're going to uh, if I if I'm a league and I don't have a long-term deal right now, I am going to be more than a little uh concerned about that. Okay, I need well I'm not going to do this, but I need a compilation of your <laughs> takes on ESPN going direct to consumer, you start, you're all over the place. You were I, look, I don't know that it, it could happen within two years. If it happens within two, you were years, saying that a couple of months ago. You said two years. You said you got you got you talked to some people and you thought that was two I, years. I just got that. Yeah, I got the sense from inside ESPN that that uh, that's it, a good place to get a sense from. Keep going. <laughs> exactly. From what a might happen? Go ahead. Sounds like but you're on the, the right chart. Check the the. There, there's a big fear about getting rid of this uh, uh, of the cable bundle, and if they if they go direct to consumer, they're still going to have a cable channel, but they're going to be inviting people to cut the cord or rebundle a, a little bit more. It's gonna it it, it will mess, it will hurt some of the revenues that are coming in. That it, it's a great business for ESPN right now. They want to keep that going as long as possible. Was the term thread the needle said to you at any point? Okay, <laughs> That's the term, John. They're going to try to thread the needle. But the thing that I think is kind of getting lost, it's not like an all or nothing uh, transition. You're not going to lose cable. And what I think is going on, and this is why, like, I'm not ready. Like, I'm a big either you're, you know, not a half measure guy. We've talked about that. So I like the ESPN strategy. I like Fox's strategy. The one thing I would say, though, is that like the idea that streaming won't work, like people are just decided it won't work, maybe, but they're also it could it could develop even more where people cut the cord even more. That said, there's not there's no reason you can't have both. Okay. Now they want it to work better than it has for newspapers, but newspapers have there's still many big newspapers that have print editions every day, and then they have websites. And so they have dual revenue streams going. And I'm not saying like, I'm sure ESPN's like, oh, I hope we can do as well as newspapers. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> the point being though, is that 
Let's all hear for print meta for print media. I love yeah, it. I know, but the point is, yes, you're going to serve the people who are going to continue with cable, which we keep talking about is starting to look better and better to have all these channels in one place um, and basically getting most of your sports there, uh, especially your major sports, uh, along, along with broadcast TV. And then you could also have this streaming service. And then there's there is a needle that can be thread that where it all comes together and i do think that happens i think you just see also the trends like you know yes is trying to yes in, in new york with the yankees are trying to get a direct to consumer by opening day msg network in new york says they're going to have one this summer uh i would think sny is a year away in new york Nesson's done it we've saw what valleys have done and i know they haven't done well but that's the trend so that trend is going to go national as well is the these people are all not all, but most of them are smart. And so there's a reason that they're doing this. It's not like they're just picking this out of thin air. Well, there's another trend that's happening as well. And that's a trend with these distributors that are losing money on video. They make all their money off of broadband. And so what what a, a trend that you've heard Altice talk about it during the quarterly calls, like how much longer are we going to actually provide video? You're seeing a, lot, a couple, not a lot yet, but you're seeing a couple small cable operators decide, oh, we're going to move forward without video. So if if a, so a you mean big, no cable, you know, so they just they're just going to sell you your internet. Yeah, you 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 have to buy broadband through us, and that yeah. that 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 they just they, they, there's no cost to that. They they just make they, they print money uh, off of that. Maybe a, a hardwired telephone, but um. But these video rights and the, and the the amount of money they pay for these channels, it's they're they're losing money off of it, and they're sort of like using it as a lost leader to bring other people in. So doesn't that though foretell that you want to be in the direct to consumer space if you're Absol ESPN? Abso absolutely, but okay. you do have companies like ESPN and you do have companies like Fox that want to keep this cable bundle going as long as it possibly can because it's it's easy good money. But it's going to keep the cable bundle. I don't. I I think that there's a. It's just. It's. It's always been mistaken. It's like DVRs. Like we're gonna hurt TV. It's like these things don't. They don't necessarily cannibalize each other. Um. Totally. I I I, I think that there's subscribe a subscriber drop that we've been seeing year to year that shows that that that, that direct to consumer is cannibalizing. And if you take a, if you step out of sports, it certainly is cannibalized on 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 the entertainment side. I mean that's. Uh, with, uh, if it weren't for sports or live news or, or you know, awards shows, I mean, nobody would have a cable bundle right now. But they do because of that. So I, I don't know. I, I think that there's a market that you want to serve and you want to do it as soon as possible is, as you can. Um, and then you have to the pricing is the most interesting aspect of it. And I but I think that ESPN is going to be priced to succeed as opposed to some of these RSNs, which seem priced to keep people on having cable. And also, just to reiterate, ESPN going direct to consumer, they're going to try to keep their, their channel going as long as it possibly can. And you're not going to be just buying ESPN. You're buying ESPN2, News, U. Uh, most likely, it'll be bundled in with ABC, Disney, and all the, yeah, uh, all, all the Fox channels they got as well. Yeah, so there's a lot they could offer where they have their own bundle. So... Uh, I'm sure they're figuring it out, and they got their needles and threads. All right, let's go RSN deals. You're super thread the, thread the needle. Talk <laughs> talk yeah. about threading the needle. Here we are. The uh, RSNs. This is the week, Andrew. That uh, Diamond Sports almost certainly is going to be uh, filing for for bankruptcy protection. Um, don't expect a lot to happen from that. They're going to file. This is the start of the whole uh, process. What I am focused on and what I find to be really fascinating about this story is that uh, with MLB, they have a totally different way of viewing this than uh, the NBA and the NHL. The NBA and the NHL, they want to work with Diamond and they want to try to keep Diamond afloat uh, and going. It's almost exactly what we were talking about with ESPN. This is a, it's a good business for their teams. And if they, if the NBA in particular can keep this going for another two years until like they, they get to their, um, their national rights deal, then that's, that's Nirvana for them. That, that works out really well. MLB, they see, they see pain coming. They want to get those rights back and they know they're not getting all those rights back all at, at, in one fell swoop, but they're going to be methodically going. They have the pirates and Rockies now, and they're trying to 
you know, we'll work out a deal with cable operators uh, to get them on linear TV in those two markets. They're going to have those go direct to consumer. Um, you know, we mentioned the the four other teams, the Diamondbacks. They have potential to get those back eventually. Uh, the Padres, Guardians, Red. So those are the sort of the four. And then as these teams see their deals come up, baseball wants to bring, uh, bring those back too. They started a local media organization within Major League Baseball, and they think that, like you said, eventually they're going to be able to make the make that revenue up through a through a streaming product and through it's just selling their games direct to um to cable. Yeah, I'm not sure you gave me one you love to give me like what I said, but I, I don't know if they're gonna make it <laughs> up. What did I say that? I didn't say that necessarily. No, no, no. I, I, I meant as you said with regards to the ESPN. Oh, okay, gotcha. Nah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A question for you. It, the Pirates and who's the other one that's uh the other the one Pirates that's, and the Rockies and Rockies. Yeah. Pirates and Rockies, what kind of pricing do you foresee for this new or whatever entity? What is this entity? Uh, I mean, we don't know yet. Okay. Uh, so, the, so, so, so there's no new entity, but like the, the, you'll be able to watch if you're in Pittsburgh, you'll be able to watch these games through your cable. That's what they're hoping. And we don't know how much it's going to cost yet. Warner Brothers Discovery Sports still says at the beginning of their uh, of the season, they will still have AT&T Sportsnet up in Pittsburgh and in Denver. Uh, so so the beginning of the season, you should be OK. Uh a month or two into the season. I mean, Warner Brothers Discovery Sports, they want out. They want to get out completely. Will they sell those channels to, to uh, Major League Baseball? Will they just sell the rights to Major League Baseball? I, like that, that, That's all part of negotiations that are happening furiously right now. With What's their leverage? Like if they don't show the games, right, then doesn't baseball or somebody have a right to get the rights back? The leverage is that they have a deal right now with cable, with the cable and satellite operators where they can show the games. If if they just shutter that channel completely and the rights re- uh, go to MLB, then MLB has to negotiate a new deal with these cable operators who will, will uh, all of a sudden they'll see a lot more leverage, the, the cable operators, and you know try to cut a big, a better price or who knows who knows what will happen there i've covered the uh the cable business i b- before coming to sports business journal i was with cable facts daily and cable world magazine i've covered this cable business for a long time they are the toughest negotiators i've i've ever seen they, they don't they don't care cable operators like like cable vision uh back in the day in uh, in uh, in new york city they don't care about bad press. They're used to bad press, and that's a, it's a you know. So they, they don't mind driving a, a hard uh, bargain and making it public. Andrew, let's go to the next topic. Uh, ESPN switched up its production team at Monday Night Football. A topic for a future pod. I wanted to do Friday afternoon news dumps. Do they still work? Or I, I think that then you give all weekend for them. I don't think they are as effective. But late Friday afternoon. Uh, ESPN said that they were replacing Jimmy Platt as director for Monday Night Football with Derek Mobley, and they were replacing Phil Dean as producer of Monday Night Football with Steve Ackles. Uh, Jimmy Platt's going to go to do uh, college football. He's going to be part of the number one college football crew. Phil Dean's going to go and also do college football, but he'll be part of the number two crew over there. What do you know about that situation? So so here's what I know. I uh... It's not fair to say that Troy Aikman or Joe Buck uh, made this change, but there was a feeling from people close to the situation that Aikman um, wanted a different producer. Um, he had uh, Richie Zions at Fox for years and years, uh, so he was used to it being a certain way. You know, Joe Buck, on the other hand, has had a lot of different producers. Uh, so, but they didn't. Their feelings, especially Aikman's, were known by the higher ups uh, at ESPN. But I don't think that they. So to say that like they he said, oh they they got to go. I don't think that's what happened. But they knew what Aikman wanted, and the way ESPN looks at it is that they had they got the rights to the Super Bowl a couple years ago. Then they brought in Buck and Aikman. Now they have three years to their Super Bowl. They want to get their production team working together for the next three years. And they want to get the right personalities and to to work together. Now, Ackles, he has been around um, Monday Night Football, probably at 10 to 12 games. So he's been around Joe and Troy. Uh, and there's a feeling that he'll be a little bit more uh, assertive 
in the booth. When you look at what they did with Dean and Platt, um, yes, it's a demotion because it's not Monday Night Football in the Super Bowl, but Platt is going to still be is going to be doing the national championship. Uh, so that's a big assignment. Dean goes and does the semifinal of the college number two team. Uh, so it's still a very good assignment. Uh, but I, I think, you know, they, they brought in Buck and Aikman. They want to do things a certain way. And I think that team hasn't melded together. Buck and Aikman kind of, they fly in a little bit later to the games. Uh, and so to get that relationship, it takes time and you have to trust. There has to be a trust between a booth and their producers and directors and so in ESPN's view, now they'll give them three years leading into their Super Bowl to get everything right. Uh, and, you know, I think they were happy with what they did uh, last year. Um, I talked to Joe Buck about this, happy about what they're doing. And I think they're excited about where it's going to go. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I don't think Aikman, he's a strong personality. We've all seen him on the sideline when he's a Cowboys quarterback yelling at his offensive lineman. I don't think he's changed. He likes things a certain way. And so I think ESPN knew that when, when they made this move. NFL insiders, you wanted to go a little bit deeper in this. I know that this was your who's up, but it sounds like this is a modified almost who's down that's coming right well, now. I just will say this. I, you know, Rich Eisen, uh, talk show host, NFL Network, he threw some stuff out there about Tom Brady. And I guess my thing is, is that I get these guys aren't really journalists or whatever. You know, Trey Wingo has put out the um, Aaron Rodgers stuff and he was right about them first meeting. And now he said it's done. And Boomer Sison a couple of weeks ago, I guess it said uh, that, you know, that Aaron Rodgers is already done. My thing with like the Rich Eisen, like Brady stuff. And I understand it's Tom Brady. I understand he's considered the greatest of all time. I understand he's super famous. But what I as a reporter always try to do is I always try to treat everybody, whomever they are big, small, or whatever, like they're people. And I don't think it's really fair just to throw out Tom Brady's going to Miami without really doing some checking on that. Like I, so, you know, he, he threw out these rumors. These are like the five. And I don't know, I guess my point would be if I'm a reporter and I cover media and I just threw out some stuff about Rich Eisen and just said, oh, hey, this, I heard this, you know, I hear a million different things all the time. I just don't think that's fair. Um, and, you know, Trey Wingo is, was right on his first thing and again by the time this podcast uh is heard by people um or a couple of days you're listening a couple you know this weekend or whenever you're, you're listening to this pod you know it might be correct i just think that if you were if they were being reported on they'd want someone to do their due diligence fully and just because tom brady and aaron Rodgers are two of the most famous athletes in the united states if not the world uh it doesn't mean that they don't deserve that same level of respect in my opinion you got nothing on that, John. No, no response. Here's the thing, and we we had this from our very first podcast with uh, Scott Van Pelt, yeah. and he he was just talking about like anybody could do a podcast, and we were like, well, we're still going to maintain reporters. Like, yeah. I don't consider myself a podcast host. I'm I'm a reporter. I mean, I mean that covers uh, media issues. You 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 are as well, and so I think that's a, that's a whole ethos that we that we bring here. We're we're still like print guys. Yes, but I uh, do get in trouble saying things. The, the way this pod we thought was going to, it's finally happened where I've been saying <laughs> things and, and every week I'm in trouble with somebody. But uh, but uh, we do. My favorite going. calls together is like, why Why are you letting Marshan say this? I'm like, I can't control Marshan. Yeah, exactly. On. Exactly. I, I Yeah. I, I, I take the blame when it's me. When it's you, though. <laughs> say, hey, listen, I got friends. They, they, they're like, what the heck is Oren talking about? <clears throat> Iran, Iran. <laughs> Andrew, let's let's hit a mailbag. Uh, you got an email from Travis Kelly. I have to admit, I stopped reading after each other after you said I enjoy the sports media podcast. So I, I agree. thank you, uh, Travis. But he had a question about the pricing of the MLS package on Apple. He thought it was too high, and he compared it to better leagues like the Premier League and to. Uh, Syria and Italy, uh, which you can actually watch for uh, for uh, less money. He ends the email, a very well-written email, saying, what are your thoughts on Apple's MLS pricing in comparison to where other better leagues are priced? Listen, it's a very good point when you when you look at it. Um, you know, for, for the Premier League, you need cable with USA Network and you need Peacock, but Peacock's what, $6, $5, $6 a month. Um, and you get, you know, a lot of extra games, uh, and then, uh, same thing about five, $6 for Paramount plus, if you want Serie A, you get champions league. Uh, it's a very good point. 
Uh, and then ESPN Plus has an array of soccer. Um, and what are we at ESPN Plus nowadays is what, $9.99 if you're not in a bundle? That's the question about MLS, right? Um, you know, they gave the, Apple gave the subscriptions to free for season ticket holders. So that's kind of a, if you're a big MLS fan, that's one way to go about it. Uh, but uh, it, it, look, $99 when you start adding all this up, I guess the, the point that they probably make is that they're not really fighting against the same time because the, now Apple's at 7.30 at night. So if you want to watch something live at 7.30 at night, you got, you know, MLS is your only soccer option. In the morning, uh, you could pay for those other, you know, they, they want you to buy both. I mean, I don't think that they're really saying it's an either or um, decision here, but the thing is that not everyone makes as much money as Apple does. So for a lot of people, it is either or because you got to make decisions because it's endless uh, with, you know, the streamers, especially with soccer, because there's so many good leagues out there. Yeah, that's what comes with exclusivity. Uh, but it, uh, I think that also the price that they, they put on that, uh, that, that package isn't designed, it's not designed to necessarily, it's almost like Sunday ticket. It's not designed to be a the, the top package. They're putting a lot of games in front of the paywall. Uh, Fox is doing a game a week, just about on on regular broadcast television. So if you're a casual fan of MLS, if you're a casual soccer fan that wants to see games in that in that time slot, there are plenty of games there. If you're a massive DC United fan that wants to see every single one of those games, yeah, you're you're gonna you're gonna uh, they they have you they have you for the exclusivity, and you're gonna have to pay ninety nine dollars for that. Well, yeah, and, and last thing about Travis's email, he had a killer comment in the middle where he said, "I consider MLS about the fifteenth to twentieth best league in the world." <laughs> That's, tough. That's tough. I mean, I think he might be talking about he might have my uh, co your rec your rec league. Yeah, is my co-ed right. league five championships uh, on <laughs> Thursday nights. He might have that higher. Uh, they're young players, twenty and thirties. A lot of college players. Just saying. Um, uh, might be we lost first game six nothing. I did not play. Um, anyway, all right, let's go to the last question as we finish up here. Um, Philip Sanford, by the way, guy, he says go toffees. I don't even know what that means. Like, I guess that that was sent to you. Uh, <laughs> don't get relegated. That has to be an Everton thing, right? Yeah, the Everton. Toffees? Yep. All right, got they're, it. They're struggling. But uh, this is all. This is sort of what we were talking about earlier on in the pod with the NCAA tournament. He had a question where he writes, "How do networks approach longtime announcers?" to tell them that it's time to hang it up. And this sort of gets into the comfort of hearing a voice. He mentioned Vern Lundquist at the Masters, saying that he he wasn't up to snuff uh, last year there. Uh, I will tell you that I have a lot of casual golf fans that still love to hear uh, Vern at number 16 on the Masters, sort of, you know, just the, the, the number of great calls that he's had there. And there's something comforting about having that voice there, it's a, a, uh, which is another way of saying it's a, you know, a big game voice of sorts. Yeah. He also brought up Greg Gumbel, um, which we talked about during the, at the end of the NFL season when he mixed up Jacoby Brissett and, and Deshaun Watson. And one other thing about Phil, when he talked about Vern, he said he's one of his favorite announcers of all time. Look, this is one of the more difficult things, first off for executives to manage. Um, and it's hard to write about. Um, I wrote about Dick Enberg back a long time ago when he was struggling, just getting things wrong. And it's hard because he's a legend, Dick Enberg, uh, and you want to be respectful because at that point, the person's older. Uh, same issue happened with Marv Albert, um, where, you know, Marv wasn't at it for a couple of years where he wasn't the same Marv Albert. Um, and if you were watching um, religiously, you noticed. Uh, and so that's a difficult thing. And I wrote about it and I said, you know, they should uh, have a retirement tour. And, and I tried to, I didn't go into every mistake. And then, you know, I got some emails. Why well, you didn't mention, it. I wasn't going to go crush Marv Albert about mistake here and mistake there. Um, that wasn't the type of column I was trying to write there. But I do think it's important to get in front of these things for a couple of reasons. I think people like, I have two things about this. I don't believe in like, like people always love like to say, well, you don't want to be Willie Mays with the Mets. Nobody thinks of Willie Mays with the Mets. When you say Willie Mays, nobody's like, well, yeah, well, yeah, those Met years. No, you think of Willie Mays as one of the greatest baseball players of all time, 660 home runs, the catch in the, over the shoulder, over his head in the World Series. That's what you think about Willie Mays. So I think people should be able to go as long as they want. That said, you sometimes have to protect them from themselves because a lot of these sportscasters, this is their li life. 
It's such a good life. They've been doing it for so long that they never want to step away. And so it's a tough thing to manage. So you have to do it gently. And this is where relationships, top executives, if you have if you're a strong executive, you can make tough decisions that are better even for the person in a lot of respects and better for your network, uh, but are not easy to do. It's easy to ignore it, but that's really not serving anybody and it's not doing your job. Willie Mays of the Mets, I thought you were going to bring up Johnny Unitas and the Chargers. Uh, back, yeah, back yeah, nobody the brings up, nobody thinks of that, right? That's the thing. <laughs> nobody thinks of that. You know, I do think when sportscasters struggle, there's a younger generation that sometimes doesn't think as highly of certain broadcasters because they didn't know them when they were at their best. And it's better. I do think it's better to leave a year too early than a year too late. Um, but it's difficult to manage for a number of reasons because these are also these are people. They're also these are conversations that, that are happening by with executives and, and talent who have spent, in some cases, decades together. I mean, they they they, they 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 genuinely like each other. There's a real relationship there. Uh, we talked earlier about ESPN's production booth. It's not just like an executive that that uh, that, that has to have these conversations. There's a whole team of people that that are set up to try to help out the the announcers. The announcers, of course, have agents, and you know there are conversations that, that that happen through there. It is very delicate to happen, but I that my my sense is a, a lot of times that it's executives that th just don't want to make the move. They they like the name, they like the voice, they know that they're not uh, as as good as as they once were. But the you know that the, they'll take a couple of mistakes just to have that you know that comfortability factor. And they don't want to be the guy who forced somebody out. I mean, and there's also legal issues in terms of ageism and stuff like that that you have to be cognizant of. But I do think if you're a strong executive, and even if you're a strong agent, I think it's you know part of your job is to be honest with your client and try to figure out the best way to do things. Um, and sometimes people aren't you know they're a little bit weaker. They're not looking out. For what's best, especially for your organization, because ultimately that's where you, uh, you know, are deriving your check from and who you sh your loyalty really should be. Um, and you have to do what's best for uh, for your company. Two emails to Andrew, Travis and Philip, both of them soccer fans. I can see what you over index right now with the, with, with the soccer fans, Andrew. What is I got to find out what my league is. Is it in the top 15 to 20? <laughs> Uh, five titles. I don't know. The like six nothing loss first game is uh, we could be in trouble this this, uh, this week. We suck again. All right, John. That's gonna do it uh, for this week. If you can like us, if you can rate us, if you can write a nice review, it's very appreciative. Uh, we got some. You know, we went solo, just you and I together this week, but uh, got some nice guests lined up in the coming weeks. Uh, looking forward to that. Uh, and as always, it was fun talking with you. Yep. Thank you for listening. See you next week.